at you, you're all puffed up in a big red truck, but you're out of luck this time. Well, that's tough, cause I'm on fire, too hot to touch, in the chat room full of lovers on the line. I can see from uh, sort of this pre-interview chat, you guys are very close and know each other quite well. Yes, I have to credit. Well, you know, like as adults, you know, they say it's hard to make friends, but sometimes when you when you meet your people in life, you just it just is natural and it clicks and you just are lifelong friends. And I think that's that's one of the joys of life. You know, yeah. the, the wonderful joys of life. We make friends as adults that are become chosen family. Yeah, I can, I can see that sort of wonderful vibe between the two of you. And that's going to transfer into a very special event coming up September 16th. Oh, yeah. You know what? So for for starters, I, playing any pride anywhere uh, is a privilege. You know, it really is because that is the to, to be asked to to share in the joy that is a pride celebration is already um, just a delight. It's humbling. Uh, but to be able to work with North Bay Pride now uh, going on, you know, three years um, for me going on four years now, three years, the past three years and going on into the fourth year for me is like um, I should just move there and yeah. be a volunteer because I just love, I love everybody. I know everybody and, um, and it's growing every year. I mean, the community grows and the larger community as a whole really does embrace uh, the celebration. And I really think that there are some very um, loving and progressive inroads that are being made into that community, which is remarkable. And I have seen that. Yes. recently that there is a, a growing um, sense of understanding in that North Bay region. Yeah, it's amazing. So Jason, tell us a little bit about what's going on, what's happening on the on the 16th. It's more than just this concert. Right. So we, we start off our Wednesday with our flag raising in the morning at 10 a.m. And then we're followed by a, a local talent event at Lou Dogs. So we're going to highlight some local talent that just want to perform in front of some people. Maybe it's their first time. Maybe it's their not. We don't know. We're just sharing the space. Um, Thursday is our big drag event. So we have uh, an open line on online competition happening right now. Um, we're a bunch of entries and there people are voting to send them the top six to the finals, which is hold, uh, hosted by Alec Mappa and Toronto Wintour. And then we have like Bombay, from Canada's Drag Race, we have uh, Suki Doll from Canada's Drag Race, we have uh, Kimmy Couture from Canada's Drag Race, and Surreal Cinder from uh, Drag Heels Season 2, and um, and also Tiki Ko from Call Me Mother, who's actually doing a big show right now that nobody's allowed to talk about yet. And then <laughs> um, they are our best judges. Um, and then on Friday, we have our Trans March. Um, we are one of the few Trans March north of Toronto now. There's also one now in Simcoe County. Um, and we do the boat cruise that night. And then on Saturday, we have our Pride March and our picnic. And then we get into our big, massive concert with Biff Naked and Carol Pope and Devin Cole, which I'm very excited about this lineup. Me too. I'm very <laughs> excited about it, too. Very excited to be a part of it. Yeah. And then on Sunday, we're doing it. This is me event uh, where some local folks are going to tell their stories and we're going to share that. And then use those stories to highlight throughout the year on social media to remind people that being your true authentic self is the most important thing and and you're not alone. At, at the crux of any of these pride events is that message, would you agree? Oh, very much so. I think it's, I think with everything that's kind of going on right now and the, the misinformation and the attacks and the, especially against trans community and the, the, the drag performers, I think being your true authentic self is very important. I think kids need to know that it's okay to be whoever they are. And whenever they figure out what that is at whatever age, that's up to them. I mean, I knew when I was five um, and I was subjected to all the straight books, the straight TV shows and the straight teachers and the homophobics. And I still came out gay. So I don't think it works any other way. I think you are who you are. And Beth, what do you think of that about um, people trying to find their way in terms of finding their own identity? I think it's, you know, obviously, um, you know, we're adults. We've gone through, um, you know, our our awkward adolescences and sometimes 
you know, scary, scary eras in our lives uh, to become the self-actualized adults that we are today and hopefully always evolving, learning, changing and growing. Um, and so for us to be able to provide not only a safe space and a safe platform for young people, um, to provide understanding uh, to them and to provide a larger picture of community support. Um, yes. I think it's integral for young people. And um, for whatever reason right now, it seems to be, um, you know, kind of uh, a big issue in the, in the larger picture of the world for some reason, mm -hmm. particularly North America, yeah. uh, which again is just like, it, I, I call it the mall of America mentality. No offense to the mall of America. But it's just, um, it's nonsense. It's kind of silly. It's kind of silly nonsense. And it's misplaced. You know, people are, in this post-pandemic world, people are agitated. Uh, people are longing. They're, um, you know, people have been disconnected for a long time. And unfortunately, there's a lot of polarization that has happened uh, socioeconomically, emotionally, the healthcare system. I mean, and, you know, many of the gaps that existed before are even broader now. Um, so for us to be able to, you know, try somehow lovingly, uh, compassionately to claw our way back to unity um, really is, it's just, it's imperative. It's imperative that we do that. And um, part of how we adults can help and assist is to be there for young people and provide them acceptance and love uh, in whatever in whatever era or season they're in in their lives and also allow them the opportunities to 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 be fluid about it and um you know um people go through different eras in their lives i know i i have and do and continue to you know sometimes everything is a spectrum in the world and uh for us to just be um really open and loving and and set a good example as uh supportive and um, empowering, encouraging adults, I think is just for me anyways, it's part of, it's part of my heart centered work and just part of being who I am. And I know that other people are on the same uh, page as me and we just need to be vocal about it. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Now you're talking about, um, a very important issue in, in, in about reaching out to kids, but I think this goes far beyond, the community as well. I was telling Jason the last time he and I spoke, um, I personally and my company took a bit of a beating about our very outspoken support for the 2S plus LGBTQ community. What do you say to the people who aren't understanding this issue? Wow, we don't have enough time. Um, there's so much to say, you know, there's so much to say. And I know that, um, you know, my parents, for example, my adoptive parents, um, were deeply involved in the civil rights movement in the sixties in America, they're Americans and they marched in Selma and they marched on Washington, uh, with King and all of his supporters. Mm -hmm. And, um, there was a lot of frustration, uh, on their end due to the, absolute lack of willingness to understand. Um, and I think that's very, very frustrating again for us, um, you know, for us in the community, whether or not, you know, we are identifying as LGBTQ or if we're allies or for family members, or if we're just community members that, you know, want to be open and loving and understanding. Um, I think it's, it's very difficult when you're up against, people who are unwilling to listen and um you know it it feels and that that happens in many different arenas whether it is the animal rights movement whether it is um you know against you know all the abortion laws that are changing in the US and of course trans rights or lgbtq rights all over the world um you know what do we do what can we do when we're up against um, human beings who refuse 
who absolutely refuse to listen or be swayed or understand or be open or be loving. What do we do? Um, they identify as everything, you know, not just Christians, but the everything. And, um, and it's hard, it's hard to understand and it's easy to feel defeated and to feel frustrated and to give up. And, and I always say, you know, we can't, that is part of, that is part of the work that we do that we're born to do. We're put on this earth to love everybody. You know, mm -hmm. we really are. And uh, to try and, and that has, that isn't even a, you know, a religious or a theological or a philosophical doctrine. That is just how human beings are built, really. Naturally, everyone is built in this way. Um, how do we, you know, how do we get that message through to other people? Sometimes, you know, it, it's not our labor anymore when it comes to people who are so adamantly, um, you know, refusing and who, you know, just really have no regard for other people's um, safety. You know, what do we do? How, you know, I think that's a very broad question. For me, all I can ever do is what I am always doing, which is just be loud and proud and uh, try with every cell of my being to protect and advocate for people that I love and for all the strangers that I love, that I don't even know, um, you know, it's really, it, it's our responsibility as um, adults living in this world, trying to work towards a world filled with loving kindness. It's our responsibility to protect other people and to try everything in our power uh, to do that every single day and to get up every day and do it again. Exactly, exactly. And now, Jason, I know um, you have been the uh, target of a lot of this. From a human perspective, let, let's leave all the political stuff aside. From a human perspective, how are you impacted when you hear this kind of stuff, the negativity? Um, it's, it's taxing. It's very taxing on the soul. That's it. My best, because you feel alone when you're getting all those attacks or you're getting those in boxes or whatever and all those comments that are specifically directed at you. Um, it's it's draining. It really is. It, it, it makes you feel, well, for me, it's made me feel that I'm very isolated, even though deep down I know I'm not. It, you know, I feel that I feel very bad for people that are other people that are seeing it because they feel they feel it's an attack on them as well. So I it's draining. But you know what? It's people like yourselves and and Biff and and our community that that reminds me that why we do this and why it's so important and why we keep getting up every day. I mean, I'm not I I show up at every event no matter what kind of threats I've gotten or whatever kind of hates, I still go. I still speak up. I still as you know, I write for one of our local papers too and I I, <laughs> I got a lot from that one <laughs> so I know um, I know you did I saw that yeah but you know what I still do it because I recognize it's important and it's not just about the community it's about that one person that you're connecting to that just needed that moment mm -hmm. to remind them that yeah. it's okay yeah yeah but uh, with Jason as your friend how do you feel about what he just said and knowing that he experiences this kind of thing. Um, well, you know, it's because we live in different towns. Um, that's a, that's a barrier for me to be able to be there every day and put my physical body in front of him, you know, and really that's what it's about. It's about um, me using my platforms uh, to reiterate, you know, the things that I believe in, which are aligned. 100% with the things that Jason is, believes in. Um, you know, all I can do every day is keep um, repeating the message of love and understanding and try in every way I can uh, to protect my friends and family uh, and to defend them and to uh, to stand up with them, with them, stand up for them and stand with them. And I think that's the key. You know, in whatever and in whatever way that looks like, and it may change all the time. And basically, you know, for me to just 
make myself available and be flexible as to um, whatever they need. And I know that um, all of my friends, you know, wouldn't do the same thing for me. How do these feelings and your um, beliefs come through in the music? Well, I've, you know, I feel like I've always been pretty lucky, you know, starting out in the punk rock scene, for example, a lot of songs that we would perform were really kind of early protest songs. You know, even though we were uh, four white skateboarding kids in Winnipeg, I mean, we still, um, you know, there were a lot of injustices that we recognized at a young age and would sing about it. And all the bands that we liked were also singing about injustices, you know, bands from the Bad Brains to SNFU to DOA particularly. Mm -hmm. Um, So it was really kind of how I learned how to songwrite. Uh, on my first record, there were songs that dealt with, um, uh, you know, conversations about experiencing rape, for example, experiencing sexual violence, and uh, then later on experiencing trying to leave domestic violence situations or, or um, you know, other people experiencing um, different barriers. And as a performer, I've always been really lucky to kind of be the one with holding the mic. And yeah. so what I've discovered all along is that in between songs, whatever uh, the song was about or not about, I could still in between the songs talk about something very specific happening in those communities uh, that I was performing in, you know, anywhere from Lexington, Kentucky to Luxembourg, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, there's always there's always community issues that need um, highlighting wherever you are in the world. And I felt very um, lucky to be able to always kind of mention things and always have a community table at the shows uh, to make sure that other, like whether it was, um, you know, gender-based violence organizations or women's shelters or even animal shelters and make sure that they had a place at our merch table that they could uh, promote, you know, the fundraisers they needed to promote also. So it's really... um, you know, there's a lot of different facets uh, mm-hmm. to being a performer that allow me uh, the opportunity to to help out where I can. Yeah, you sound like you're very emotionally invested in all of this. Oh, absolutely. I think all of us are, you know, really and truly like, you know, when they say that we're we're passionate about something, it's because it's in our heart. People get um, people get upset with uh, brands, for example, like Pride is a perfect example. Pride Month. A lot mm-hmm. of brands whether it's banks or whether it's like, you know, clothing companies, they're just like, everything is rainbow flags and and people kind of, you know, poo poo it a lot saying that it's performative. And I always say it doesn't matter. You know what? Who cares? Who cares if that big bank wants to spend the money and give a percentage of um, money to LGBTQ charities, or they want to highlight organizations have at her it's just like great doesn't you know me i think any anything helps and everything helps absolutely absolutely now there's one more uh thing that i wanted to talk about that i'm kind of excited about your documentary (sighs) (laughs) the documentary has been filming um all over the world uh, for the last almost almost three years, I share my personal life all the time on social media. But I, I all like all of us, there's a private life uh, that we don't share. Uh, you know, Jason and I can both uh, tell you, you know, whether it is, you know, we have a parent that's dying or we're, you know, we're caregiving for an elderly aunt or we have migraines or, you know, this and that and the other thing. There's there's lots of things in life that um, that don't get shared. And my memoir that was written, um, published in 2016 called Ibifakes was written in 2013. So I feel, and it was, it was very, um, it was very polite. It was a very polite memoir yeah. um, with the editors at Harper Collins being very careful. And that was great. Um, but the documentary definitely goes into things um, that was not allowed to be in the book, for example, in, in my memoir. Um, mm-hmm. and it goes to a lot of places that I've never shared before. Um, mm-hmm. I've been married three times. 
um, you know, maybe that'll be out of 20. I don't know. I'm quite an optimist. Um, but, you know, there's there's a lot of layers to a person's life. And, and to be in the hands of Jennifer Abbott, I just think that, you know, I feel safe sharing uh, a lot of my life, which is is complicated and and wild and funny um we've filmed in paris we filmed in mexico we're filming all over the world mm -hmm. and um and we're also filming shows and like you know jason has met my director before and you know in my in the families that i'm in in the households that i share with my little yorkie uh there are five dogs you know, and there's lots of rescue dogs and then there's angel flights of rescue dogs. And there's just like, there's other aspects that I think that are going to be um, showcased in the documentary. I've had a lot of stalkers. We've had a lot of uh, court dates due to stalkers. I've had a lot of police involvement in my life. There's been a lot of violence in my life, um, even as a person with a career that has 10 records. And uh, that's going to be uh, in the documentary, which has never been shared before. Um, so I think that, you know, um, I think that it's going to be eye opening for people. Um, I'm not nervous about it because it's just my life. Um, and, yeah. you know, I have, you know, I, I feel every day I feel lucky to be alive and living the life that I am. Uh, so, you know, in that regard, I'm not scared, but my my birth family is going to be interviewed. And so for the first time, my birth mom, who's mm -hmm. only 15 years older than me, mm -hmm. gets to share her story. And I think, you know, if nothing else, that's probably one of the most important aspects to me of the documentary. Yeah. Are you looking at a 2024 release date or? I'm hoping so. Like, I think that they really uh, know how proud I am. As a Canadian, I was the only Canadian in my family growing up. And it's something that, you know, is important to me. So I think that they, instead of what they were originally planning to do, I think that what I want to do is to um, premiere it at uh, TIFF yeah. next year. Not this fall, but next fall. Now, I have a little bit of hot, well, you know, more accurately, Jason has a little bit of uh, news for you. Jason, take it away. Oh. I do have some news for you. Um, I don't know if you remember us talking about awards and different type of things that we were talking about, like what to come up with awards. And I, I said to you, what would you, what would you, if you ever did an award, what would you think it would be? So we decided on when you're here that we're going to give the first ever Biff Naked Doing Good Award. Ah, you're so sweet. Oh my goodness. Because it's inspired, I, by, yeah, but it's inspired by all the things you do. And it's so just sweet. doing good. And and when we talked about it, you said, you know, that was the one thing that always stood out is doing good. And and we thought, let's just do this and it will be an annual award. Your, this, you, this is why we're friends. You're just <laughs> so thoughtful, Jason. That is so sweet. But you know what? It, but it inspires people and it speaks volumes because it is about just doing good in the world and and I think people need to start knowing that. And I think you're a prime example of that. And we thought this is kind of like a legacy for you. You're so sweet. And I'll carry on. Cry on camera. I'm too old to cry. <laughs> Girls like me can't cry. Because then we cry our makeup off. Yes. But yeah. anyway, so that's what we're doing. T-shirt. So I just wanted to share that with you. Thank and we you. thought we will do it while you're here. During your <laughs> concert. And we kind of have a couple of ideas of who we're just kind of figuring out the final amazing that's amazing this is just you've made my entire you've made my entire summer cool that was amazing good. yes you've made my entire summer thank and you Sabina, okay. just so you know that biff and i met 25 years ago in molson <laughs> indy oh, i didn't know that yeah <laughs> molson indy vancouver yeah, and indy, I had, at the were... time i was there with a neurologist boyfriend yes <laughs> oh you're in tears sweetie i know this is my dog's baby shirt I know it's yes if I could yes if I could breastfeed my Yorkie I would but I don't so. <laughs> I know I'm a dog mama <laughs> too she's over there sleeping <laughs> well I thank you both so much for this 
And I appreciate you putting up with all the little technical bumps that oh, we had. I'm so happy that we got a chance to talk and, and so uh, grateful to you. So thank you for doing the interview. And we are going to be talking again because Jason has very generously invited us to go backstage for the concert. Yay! So I will see you there. And again, for our viewers, September 16th. Awesome. I can't awesome. wait. I'm calm. I'm going to be a 